Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Friday, July 17th. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. But you, O Lord, are on high forever. For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies shall perish. All evildoers shall be scattered. But you have exalted my horn like that of the wild ox. You have poured over me fresh oil. My eyes have seen the downfall of my enemies. My ears have heard the doom of my evil assailants. The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. They still bear fruit in old age. They are ever full of sap and green to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Our New Testament reading today is from Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view than mine, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. And our second to last day on the Small Called Articles, which we will finish on Monday. We will be covering, and these are short articles. The first one on confession is a little longer, but the other ones are very brief. On confession, excommunication, 
uh, ordination and the divine call and the marriage of priests. Absolution, or the power of the keys, is an aid against sin and a consolation for a bad conscience. It is ordained by Christ in the Gospel, Matthew 16, 19. Therefore, confession and absolution should by no means be abolished in the church. This is especially for the sake of timid consciences and untrained young people, so they may be examined and instructed in Christian doctrine. But the listing of sins should be free to everyone as to what a person wishes to list or not to list. For as long as we are in the flesh, we will not lie when we say, I am a poor man full of sin. I see in my members another law, and such. Romans 7.23 Since private absolution originates in the office of the keys, it should not be despised, but greatly and highly esteemed, along with all the other offices of the Christian Church. In issues relating to the spoken outward word, we must firmly hold that God grants His Spirit or grace to no one, except through or with the preceding outward word, Galatians 3.2 and 5. This protects us from the enthusiasts, i.e., souls who boast that they have the Spirit without and before the Word. They judge Scripture or the spoken Word and explain and stretch it at their pleasure, as Munzer did. Many still do this today, wanting to be sharp judges between the Spirit and the letter, and yet they do not know what they are saying, 2 Corinthians 3.6. Actually, the papacy, too, is nothing but sheer enthusiasm. The Pope boasts that all rights exist in the shrine of his heart. Whatever he decides and commands within his church is from the Spirit and his right, even though it is above and contrary to Scripture in the spoken word. All this is the old devil and old serpent, Revelation 12.9, who also turned Adam and Eve into enthusiasts. He led them away from God's outward word to spiritualizing and self-pride. And yet he did this through other outward words. In the same way, our enthusiasts today condemn the outward word. Yet they themselves are not silent. They fill the world with their babbling and writings as if the Spirit could not come through the Apostles' writings and spoken word, but has to come through their writings and words. Why don't they leave out their own sermons and writings and let the Spirit himself come to people without their writings before them, as they boast that he has come into them without the preaching of the Scriptures? We do not have time now to argue about this in more detail. We have treated this well enough elsewhere. For even those who believe before being baptized or become believing in baptism believe through the outward word which came first. For example, adults who have come to reason must first have heard, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, Mark 16:16. 16, 16. Even though they are at first unbelieving and receive the Spirit in baptism ten years afterward, Cornelius, living among the Jews, had heard long before about the coming Messiah, through whom he was righteous before God, Acts 10, 1-2. In such faith his prayers and alms were acceptable to God, since Luke calls him devout and God-fearing. Without the word coming first and without hearing it, he could not have seen or believed or been righteous, Romans 10, 17. St. Peter, though, had to reveal to him that the Messiah, in whom he had previously believed as one who would come in the future, now had come, lest his faith in the coming Messiah hold him captive among the Jewish people, who were hardened and unbelieving. He must now know that he is saved by the present Messiah and must not, with the Jewish people, deny or persecute him. In a word, enthusiasm dwells in Adam and his children from the beginning to the end of the world. Its venom has been implanted and infused into them by the old serpent. It is the origin, power, and strength of all heresy, especially of that of the papacy and Muhammad. Therefore, we must constantly maintain this point. God does not want to deal with us in any other way than through the spoken word in the sacraments. Whatever is praised is from the Spirit, without the word in the sacraments, is the devil himself. God wanted to appear even to Moses through the burning bush in spoken word, Exodus 3, 2-15. No prophet, neither Elijah nor Elisha, received the Spirit without the Ten Commandments or the spoken word. John the Baptist was not conceived without the word of Gabriel coming first, nor did he leap in his mother's womb without Mary's voice, Luke 1, 11 to 20 and 41. Peter says, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, 2 Peter 1, 21. Without the outward word, however, they were not holy, much less would the Holy Spirit have moved them to speak when they were still unholy. 
They were holy, says he, since the Holy Spirit spoke through them. Article 9, Excommunication The greater excommunication, as the Pope calls it, we regard only as a civil penalty, as it does not concern us ministers of the Church. But the lesser, truly Christian excommunication is this. Open and hard-hearted sinners are not admitted to the sacrament and other communion of the Church until they amend their lives and avoid sin. 1 Corinthians 5 Ministers should not mingle secular punishments with this punishment from the church or excommunication. Uh, and just an aside on that, the, the greater excommunication uh, that the Pope calls it, and that uh, is actually where uh, the Pope has the ability to cast someone out of heaven, that they are forever uh, condemned to hell until that excommunication was uh, reversed, which is actually... Not a real thing at all. Article 10, Ordination and the Call. If the bishops would be true bishops and would devote themselves to the church and the gospel, we might grant them to ordain and confirm us and our preachers. This would be for the sake of love and unity, but not because it was necessary. However, they would have to give up all comedies and spectacular display of unchristian parade and pomp. But they do not even want to be true bishops, but worldly lords and princes, who will neither preach, nor teach, nor baptize, nor administer the Lord's Supper, nor perform any work or office of the church. Furthermore, they persecute and condemn those who do discharge these functions, having been called to do so. So the church should not be deprived of ministers because of the bishops. Therefore, as the ancient examples of the Church and the Fathers teach us, we ourselves should ordain suitable persons to this office. Even according to their own laws, they do not have the right to forbid or prevent us. For their laws say that those ordained even by heretics are truly ordained and stay ordained. As St. Jerome writes of the Church at Alexandria, at first it was governed in common by priests and preachers, without bishops. Article 11. The Marriage of Priests they have neither the authority nor the right to ban marriage and to burden the divine order of priests with perpetual celibacy. They have acted like anti-Christian, tyrannical, desperate scoundrels, and by this have caused all kinds of horrible, outrageous, innumerable sins of unchastity, depraved lusts, in which they themselves still wallow. Now neither we nor they have been given the power to make a woman out of a man or a man out of a woman, or to nullify either sex. So they have had no authority to separate such creatures of God or to forbid them from living honestly in marriage with one another. Therefore, we are unwilling to agree to their outrageous celibacy, nor will we tolerate it. We want to have marriage free as God has instituted it, and we want neither to repeal nor hinder his work. For Paul says that this ban on marriage is the teachings of demons. 1 Tim Timothy 4, 1-3. And Monday we will finish the small called articles with the short articles on the church, how we are justified before God and do good works, monastic views, and human traditions. We now join together in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And our Friday prayer focuses on the passion of Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, true God and true man, we thank you that you have redeemed us poor and condemned creatures, 
not by any of our works, merit, or worthiness, but by your holy suffering, death, and shedding of blood. O Lord, your suffering was great, your torment was heavy. We cannot comprehend how many your stripes, how deep your wounds, or the bitterness and painfulness of your death. How inexpressible is your love that reconciled us to your heavenly Father. In great fear of death, you sweat blood on the Mount of Olives, drops of blood that fell upon the earth. And there, abandoned by all your disciples, you willingly gave yourself into the hands of those who led you mercilessly, bound hard and cruel, from one unjust judge to another. You were falsely accused and condemned, spit upon, scoffed at, and struck in the face with fists. For the sake of our misdeeds you were hit, whipped, crowned with thorns, and treated wretchedly, like a worm and not a man. You were despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, so that even a heathen heart took pity and said, Behold the man. For the sake of our sin you were counted a sinner, and hung up between two evildoers as a curse. You were pierced in hands and feet with nails, and in your highest thirst you were given vinegar and gall to drink. Finally, in great pain, you gave up your spirit so that you could pay our debt, and we could be healed by your wounds. O Lord Jesus Christ, for this and all your other suffering and pain we give you thanks and praise. We pray you, let your holy, bitter suffering and death not be lost on us, but grant that at all times this may be our comfort, and that we may boast in it, and that as we ponder it all evil desire in us may be snuffed out and subdued, and all virtue may be implanted and increased, so that we, having died to sin, may live in righteousness, following the example you have left us, walking in your footsteps, enduring evil with patience, and suffering injustice with a good conscience. Amen. Merciful God, for freedom you have set us free through Christ's liberating death and resurrection. In this freedom, teach us to live in the fruit of the Spirit given us in our baptism, that we may bear in our bodies the fulfillment of the law as we love our neighbors as ourselves. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.